Sukui Garner Vaughn. I am Tad Larkin, the lore master of Mandalore, and today I'll be digging through the archives to elaborate on the Imperial Army Troopers. When one normally thinks of the military of the Galactic Empire, they immediately conjure images of the white armored shells of Imperial stormtroopers marching in measured steps in neat orderly rows. But what most may be surprised to learn is, the Stormtrooper Corps was only one branch within the vast Imperial military. The boots on the ground, so to speak, standard infantry of the Galactic Empire, and often the unsung heroes of many engagements were the troopers of the Imperial Army. While it's true that the Imperial Stormtrooper Corps were often the vanguard force in many battles, it was the Imperial Army Troopers that were charged with maintaining and enforcing the Empire's land-based superiority, often in conjunction with the Stormtrooper Corps as well as the Imperial Navy. Though they are not as elite or as spectacularly equipped as their comrades in the Stormtrooper Corps, the Imperial Army Troopers still boast an impressive kit. The standard field uniform of an Imperial Army Trooper consists of a one-piece jumpsuit of either grey, light grey, or olive coloring depending on deployment environment, weather-resistant gloves, durable boots that go almost to knee height, and a utility belt, which can carry pouches for thermal detonators and blaster power packs. A large durasteel cuirass is often worn to protect the Imperial Army Trooper from shrapnel, glancing and low-power blaster shots, and can come in two varieties, one with and without shoulder pauldrons. But as these cuirasses would cost more, many Imperial Army Troopers simply went without. While the cuirass wasn't standard issue, head protection was, and a full helmet that protected the head, neck, and ears while leaving the face open for visibility was worn, and also had an integrated DH-77 helmet comm. Eye protection, usually goggles, were worn separately, but could be wrapped around the helmet when on march or in bivouac. Though they're not often seen wearing backpacks, Imperial Army Troopers were issued one backpack each, which can carry a tent, bedroll, a 1.5 liter canteen, rations, entrenching tools, and maintenance kits for their blasters. Almost every blaster that were available to the Imperial Stormtroopers were available to the Imperial Army Troopers as well, but it was more common to see them wielding the Blastech E11 blaster rifle rather than an unwieldy T21 or some of the other larger blasters in Blastech Industries' arsenal. The history of the branch is surprisingly older than one would think, and stretches all the way back to the Reformation of the Republic, 1,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. After the Seventh Battle of Rusan, which ended the new Sith Wars and seemingly defeated the Sith once and for all, the fragmented Galactic Republic was brought back together under a revised constitution which not only incorporated the Jedi Order into the judicial branch of government, but also dissolved the Republic's standing army and navy altogether. But the tens of thousands of Jedi Knights would not be enough to keep the peace throughout the vast Republic alone, and the Republic judicial forces were created to aid the Jedi, but their role was more of a federal police force than that of a proper military. Fast forward about 950 galactic standard years, and the Republic is in a bit of rough shape. Pirates are running rampant on the Outer Rim, the Mandalorians are involved in a civil war which sometimes spills out of their home sector, and a human male by the name of Ayako Stark has united a bunch of pirates under his banner, and is beginning to exploit a Bacta shortage by raiding Trade Federation shipments and reselling the miracle medical substance. In response to this, Ranalf Tarkin, the elected governor of the Sesuana Sector, established the Outlands Region Security Force from his home planet of Iriadu, and without sanction by the Senate, began taking the defense of the Outer Rim into his own hands. By 44 BBY, the situation had escalated into the Stark hyperspace conflict, and on the Outer Rim world of Troikan, at the Sheb's end of the Perlemian trade route, Tarkin's forces clashed with those of the Stark Commercial Combine, and while his space forces were decimated, the Jedi led his forces to victory during the ground battle, and held off long enough for a Trade Federation relief force to turn the tide.
During the Clone Wars from 22 to 19 BBY, the beings serving in both the Judicial Forces and the Outlands Region Security Forces volunteered to supplement the clone troopers of the newly formed Grand Army of the Republic, and proved crucial during the war's early months, when only a million clones were available for immediate deployment from Kamino. By the war's end, there were a significantly larger amount of clone troopers active in the galaxy, and when Palpatine dissolved the Republic and established the Galactic Empire, the clones became the backbone of the Imperial Stormtrooper Corps. The Judicial Forces and ORSF, meanwhile, would be absorbed by the Greater Imperial Military and rebranded the Imperial Army which sought out regular human recruits to train, whereas the Stormtrooper Corps would remain clone only for another few years before they too were open to non-clone human recruits. Recruitment offices were set up all over the Empire, where Imperial citizens could submit their applications to do their part in bringing peace and order to the galaxy, and once accepted, they were shipped off to one of the many drop camps for basic training. Within each drop camp, the Imperial Army Trooper Cadets were trained in basic hand-to-hand -hand fighting, entrenchment, combat survival skills, as well as ordnance and heavy weapons training apart from their regular weapons training. Key to the indoctrination of the Imperial Army Trooper were the four principles. Metal, Obedience, Discipline, and Selflessness. The principle of metal stated that you will not flinch in the face of enemy fire, nor will you accept defeat. You will give your life to destroy the enemies of the Empire. Obedience outlined never questioning orders, and that the chain of command existed for a reason, while discipline stressed the importance of keeping your body, mind, and equipment in top physical condition, and finally selflessness reminded the Imperial Army Trooper that they're part of a unit, and have a role to play, and only will each individual trooper performing their best lead to victory. Not all personnel within the Imperial Army go into the infantry, as there were several specialized roles and sub-branches in which an Imperial Army cadet can be assigned. Imperial Army personnel in the Armored Cavalry operate and maintain the Empire's light armored vehicles, such as ATSTs, ATPTs, and other lightly armored infantry support and transport vehicles. They also typically wear the same gear as the Imperial Army troopers, minus a cuirass. In the Heavy Armored Cavalry, Army personnel operate and maintain the Empire's, you guessed it, Heavy Armored Vehicles, such as the at IFT, HAVT B5 Juggernaut, and other heavy tanks and transports. They typically wear full face covering Stormtrooper pilot helmets, equipped with rebreathers for extra survivability in the event of engine fires and other catastrophic vehicle failures. Troopers within the Imperial Army Medical Corps received advanced medical training along with their standard Imperial Army training, and carried with them into battle triage kits, splints, gauze, and most importantly Bacta, to render medical aid in the middle of combat. Lastly, you had the Imperial Army Special Mission Troopers, who, while not as advanced as, say, the Imperial Commandos or the Storm Commandos, received a specialized training that set them apart from the standard troopers, and would often act as sharpshooters and combat engineers. When it came to the organization of the Imperial Army, the smallest unit was a squad, which was made up of nine Imperial Army troopers led by a sergeant, and came as several types. Standard line squads with standard troopers, heavy weapons squads with heavily armed troopers, sharpshooter squads, engineering squads, and scout squads. Next, the platoon consisted of four squads of Imperial Army troopers led by a lieutenant, and like squads, came in several types based on unit specialization, which followed a similar pattern. Line platoons, assault platoons, which could consist of a mix of line and heavy weapons squads, artillery platoons armed with V-188s, C-136s, or even small mortars, armor platoons, which could consist of four AT-ATs or eight repulsor lift tanks, special missions platoons, and scout platoons. Once you get into the organization of Imperial Army companies, we begin to see a lot more mixing of different types of squads and platoons in different companies, but in general, companies consisted of four platoons led by a captain. 
line companies were generally made up of line platoons with one or more heavy weapons platoons. Assault companies had two line platoons and two assault platoons. Scout companies were four scout platoons. Repulsor lift companies had two line platoons and two repulsor lift platoons. You then had armor companies, artillery companies, and special missions companies, with a variety of different configurations of squads and platoons. Things start to get even more complicated once you reach the battalion level, but for simplicity's sake, a battalion generally consists of four companies led by a major. Line battalions consisted of three line companies and one heavy weapons company. Assault battalions had two heavy weapons companies, a repulsor lift company, and a line company. Artillery battalions consisted of one heavy weapons company to guard three artillery batteries. Armor battalions, which included an interchangeable mix of companies and platoons consisting of heavy and light walkers and other armored tracked or repulsor lift vehicles, and lastly, special missions battalions. Moving up, we have the regiment, which consisted of four battalions led by a lieutenant colonel. And at this point, as we move up to the continental, then planetary, then system level unit organizations, we will begin to see more complex combinations of different types of battalion, company, and platoon unit specializations, which can all be interchangeable, but follow the same pattern, such as line regiments, assault regiments, artillery regiments, and armor regiments. Battle groups consisted of four regiments led by a colonel, and were capable of capturing a continent. You had line battle groups, assault battle groups, armor battle groups, and mobile battle groups. An Imperial Army Corps consisted of four battle groups led by a major general, and were capable of capturing an entire planet. Line Corps, Armor Corps, and Mobile Corps were common types. Lastly, you had an army, which consisted of four corps led by a general. These could be multiplied even further to systems armies, which consisted of one to three armies, and finally sector armies, which consisted of multiple systems armies, and were so large that they were usually commanded by a moth or grand moth. The troops of the Imperial Army would go on to fight in some of the most decisive battles of the Galactic Civil War against the Rebel Alliance, such as the Battle of Hoth three years after the Battle of Yavin, where a platoon of at, -AT walkers dubbed Thundering Herd assisted the stormtroopers of Blizzard Force and the 501st Legion in assaulting the Rebel base there under General Maximilian Veers. Imperial Army forces were also at the Battle of Endor in 4 ABY, and 1 at, -AT and about 40 ATSTs joined Imperial Stormtrooper and Navy personnel to make up Tempest Force, although unlike their comrades at Hoth a year earlier, they would not triumph against the Rebels. Following the Emperor's death at Endor, several Imperial Moths, Governors, Admirals, and Generals began breaking away from the Empire to establish their own miniature empires in their home sectors, and with them took their own Imperial Army contingents as well as Stormtroopers. This parallel war between the Warlords and the main chunk of the original Empire being held together by Isani Isard and later Thrawn would become known as the Imperial Civil War. And this, combined with the New Republic's continued liberation of worlds, caused the Empire, as well as many of the Warlords, to make service within the Imperial Army compulsory. Eventually, through the failed leaderships of Isard, Thrawn, the Resurrected Emperor, and Admiral Dalla, what was left of the Imperial Warlords were eventually destroyed and consolidated into the Imperial Remnant, now ruled by a Moff Council under Supreme Commander Grand Admiral Gilad Pelion. At some point after the Second Galactic Civil War, Jagged Fell, son of famous TIE fighter ace Baron Suntir Fell, became Emperor and married Jaina Solo, daughter of Han and Leia Organa Solo, establishing a new dynasty and with it, many reforms to the Imperial military. The Stormtrooper Corps was eventually absorbed into the Imperial Army, eliminating Imperial Army troopers as infantry and utilizing Stormtroopers as the mainline infantry unit, and softening attitudes towards non-humans granted them the ability to enlist and serve their empire.
This transmission was commissioned by Wirefox Terrier on Patreon. If you have any suggestions for future transmissions, don't be afraid to drop a comment. Special thanks to my patrons, Wildcat144, Zexen, JTrips1997, Wirefox Terrier, Dave the Grave, Zim the Despot, Matt Patton, Trav, Hawk2274, Cal Scarada, Angry Mutt, Chris Evans, Mayo4, Moon Man, Noah Shane45, and The Framinator. If you'd like to support this channel, and perhaps even commission your own video topic, please visit my Patreon to find out how. Link is in the description. In the meantime, keep your calm channels open for future transmissions, and don't forget to subscribe. Tad Larkin, out.